Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, The Wickoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, Genova Burns. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, NA, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grubnight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Luncheonettes, golf balls, Pepsi trucks, entertainment, booking people up at the, the mountains, you know, running around, you know, city college, law school, Lindsay administration, Nixon's favorite guy that he wanted to get rid of, Jimmy's restaurant, lawyer, lobbyist. I got Sid Davidoff. Thanks for being here today. You didn't say pilot. Pilot? I, I, I have a license to fly a helicopter and, and fixed wing. Oh, I knew you were in the Army, but you were. No, no that wasn't your, your training. This is in the much Army. later in so life. Said, but go ahead, you okay, got enough okay, there. Okay, so let, let's go back. Tell me a little bit about your parents, where they came from. You know, My fa father came from Russia, came over here about six years of age with his mother um, in Brooklyn. Um, I never knew much about his family, never talked much about it. Um, I don't even know how quite he wet my mother, but <laughs> they married and had a, 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 a girl, a child, seven years older than me, my sister Judy, and myself, um, and um, it, we were in the candy store business. Right, you were in the candy store business, and you lived, the, the first place was Brooklyn, right? Born in Brooklyn. Uh, in Queens. At, at the age of one, moved to Queens and lived behind the candy store. Behind the candy store. Later, we lived above the candy store. So w which one was behind the candy store and which one was above the candy store? In Jamaica, was we had a, 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 my father would keep a place for several years, try to build it up. And then sell them. And it, make, bring Briar's ice cream in. He always claimed that was the best. And uh, then sell it and, and then try to and buy another uh, restaurant, uh, luncheonette. So we would move around a little bit, all, always in Queens. Uh, so it was Jamaica, Queens Village, Flushing, um, Jackson Heights, that's pretty much, and even for a period of time in Manhattan. How was Manhattan? In Manhattan, you had the ability to put the sugar. That was your job, right? You were. Uh, the uh, I was very young. You know, was, we're talking now, it was Saturday morning at seven years of age, I'd go to work with my father, uh, which was fun. Uh, and uh, he, had, he had a small uh, corner store 40th on 40th and 6th. Doesn't exist now, obviously. 40th and 6th had a corner store with the window. And there wasn't much room inside. But he would make cherry lime rickies and make coffee. It was all you know, out, out stuff, cigarettes and so on, uh, when you could buy it in those days at a reasonable price. Um, and he would bring me in. And, it, and, and we're talking real late 40s now. 
um, the middle 40s. Uh, they had the big container of sugar. Didn't have such thing as sugar bags at that time. And I would sit there with a cup and put it into a little plastic or glassine bag uh, and staple it, and that would be what would go out with the sugar orders during the week. When you now, you also coffee. made some deliveries with you. That was, uh, I was a little bit older than that, and that was in, in Queens Village, where my father also had a, uh, this was a luncheonette now, so a little bit different. And uh, that's the one we lived above. Uh, and I would deliver to the Republican Club on the block, coffee, sandwiches, stuff like this that. This was in Queens? This was in Queens. At that time, the Republican Party in Queens Village. This was the roots. Yeah. Right. This, you know, you, you, you really ate this up, as you said to me. You really enjoyed right. going to these clubs. It was a no. nice camaraderie, right? It was more than that. This was a place when I would go in, I, they'd say, hey, kid, you want two tickets for Evans Field on Saturday? And I could go to Evans Field. I saw people lined up there to need help, whether it was the uh, son that was in trouble with the law, the need tax help, whatever, maybe. The Republican Club, the political club, was the place to go. There was no anti-poverty yeah, agency. Uh, right. It was also the place where people would get people apartments. They would, yeah. Jobs. It was everything. It was, it was the place. Right? And I said, you know, I want to be part of this. You know, the, the, and maybe they'd shoot me uh, for saying this, but... Uh, I knew it was going to be a smoke. This was a smoke-filled room. I just wanted to be part of the smoke-filled room. I wanted to participate. This is where I belonged. Now, That's what I did. But in between the Republican Club, you had this a variety of odd jobs, right? Okay, what was the Pepsi-Cola? One summer, I was able to get uh, work on a Pepsi-Cola truck out of Brooklyn, uh, uh, in, in going into the Rockaways, uh, carrying case, because I was going to school at night to get out quicker. Now, you also had uh, the... You learned to be a caddy. You got five. That bucks. was very young. That was a that was a young. Yeah, that, that was, was a good. I used to, I, that was a good career. That was. That was you know a very good career. It taught me not to, to to truly hate golf, but um, it was. And I started at about eleven years of age. <clears throat> Would go on take my bike to the bus and take the bus to the golf course, and that was the best job I ever had. Now, what, you made the extra buck with the glove catching yeah, what, the balls. You know, you do your round and get there seven o'clock in the morning. You do a round. Uh, I could only, it was too small to carry two bags, so you carry one bag. You made five bucks, which was a lot of money in those days. And then you could, they, the pro would be given lessons. Um, you, they were called shagging balls. You would go out, and as they were hitting the drives or, or whatever, the irons, you would get the balls and put them back in the basket. It was pre-day before they had uh, things that picked up the balls. And so you would and put it back and give it back to the pro. And that would be a buck an hour. That was a tw- and I would go out my go- my my uh, baseball glove, and I would catch the balls when I could, or just run around and get them. So that was a great job. Now you said to me when we got together, when you were going to high school, there was this group of guys, uh, the fraternity. You know, a lot of these guys are still good, long time friends with you. That you practice law with. You've done other things. Tell me about that. It was uh, also a very important thing in. Well, this was it. important in my life. There's no doubt about it. The the, the First of all, I would have gone to Andrew Jackson, and it was a very tough crowd in my neighborhood. I was very young. I graduated grade school in eighth, eighth grade at 12, uh, and uh, I, I was going not to have one of the great careers. So um, fortunately, my, my parents knew enough. My mother somehow knew enough that if I took Hebrew, I could go out of my neighborhood and go to Jamaica. In those days, each borough had one school where you could take Hebrew. So I got out. I went to Jamaica. At Jamaica. Well, you didn't want to be a rabbi. That we knew that was something. No. I was just taking Hebrew. I needed to take some language, so I took Hebrew. Got into Jamaica. That was really the change of my life. Got out of that neighborhood, met a, a bunch of guys, joined the high school fraternity, became a leader within the high school fraternity. It was a national fraternity. I became a national officer while I was in college. Um, and it was, so I was mentored, and I was able to mentor others, but it was that camaraderie to today from that high school fraternity, we meet every few months with 20 guys, 15, 20, 25 guys, who come back and just enjoy each other's companies. They, they were very important to me in my political life because when I started working in the clubhouse, volunteering in the clubhouse in Manhattan for John Lindsay uh, and Vince Albano, who at that time uh, was, the, was the Democratic, excuse me, Republican leader, uh, it was, I brought in a bunch of those guys who helped me out. And when you come in with strength of numbers, it makes a lot more difference than you're walking by yourself. So you said you graduated public, uh, junior high school at 12. 
You graduated high school at 16, right? Mm -hmm. And how did you decide that you wanted to go to City College? <laughs> it was only choice. <laughs> <laughs> this was not, uh, you know, it, I, you went to City College or you, or you went in the Army. That was my two choices. Okay, but you could have got to City College Uptown or you could have got to Brook. I went to Brook. I went to Brook. Well, I thought I wanted to be an accountant. I was wrong. But also, why it had... Think, why do you think you wanted to be an accountant? It there was like no relative. I mean, Wait, it was uncle. Who, didn't you have an my uncle? Uh, my uncle, my uncle, who was the lawyer. only really educated person in my family at that time, was a lawyer. Right. So uh, and I wanted to it. follow in his footsteps. I thought accountant would be one way of going, but it was also it was basically it was also the school of business and public administration, and I knew that government at some point in my career was going to be very important. From the days of the Republican Club and the other. I was going to be a blessing. I started working campaigns. As a kid, volunteering, doing the scut work that has to be done. Um, I did it for local Queens politicians, and then when I, uh, I had the good fortune to meet John Lindsay. So what about before we meet Lindsay, how do you get into the, uh, the Catskills? Uh, ah. A booking agent, you know. Well, I, I mean, you know, you're a fellow friar, but, you know, we, we've never called you a booking agent. No. That, I had to make a couple of bucks somewhere. So there's always a you know, possibility of how to make a buck, an honest buck. Uh, I worked in the Catskills uh, several summers as a uh, started as a busboy. Went up to captain of the waiters. Uh, when I c but then I had to uh, go to night school during the summer, both in in uh, in college and in law school. Uh, law school had to get out quickly too. I wanted to get on with my career, so I I needed to find a job that I could do, which I could do in between going to school and other jobs. And the booking agent, I, these kids I grew up with, had a great band, at least I thought they were a great band, and knew other musicians. So I figured out I would go up to the Catskills, which I knew pretty well by this time. We used to, I was a pretty what much- What was that a, place? A Mountain uh, Shanks? Uh... Shanks Paramount uh, was one. We had um, the Neverly, you had, uh, you know, uh, Morningside, which was the non-kosher hotel. Uh, there were a bunch of hotels. And I would take the bands around and audition to get them jobs. And then I would go up after Thursday night after law school with we two because I didn't have school on Friday. I would go up on my scooter and I'd hang out with the guys, do some teaching of uh, uh, dancing that paid, paid my way, my, my wages up there and made a little commission on the band. So you, you, you finished City College, Brooke. How did you decide on NYU? My uncle went there. So uncle went there. So, and so I just, I didn't think about anything else. I didn't, that was, it's where he went. Now, you had some jobs during this period of time. You had some, a lot of things came from Vince Albano and- My first two years I went to uh, law school at night. Uh, I couldn't afford to do otherwise. Uh, I also graduated in three and a half years from college. So I, I, I started in January. My limit, there was a limitation of where you can go. When was, the, when was the army, in between law school or? No, after law school. Okay. Um, that was terrible, by the way. But <laughs> it's the reserves, okay, remember yeah, those. That's six months of waste. But uh, oh, military police, I learned a lot. Uh, now, the, 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 uh, I went to law school at night. I worked as a junior tax examiner during the day with this, uh, the tax. I, well, I had a few credits. Wait a second. You told me you, you, you would monitor cars? What was this? No, no. What, this hard job? With it, it was a very easy job. And thank heaven it was easy because I was able to study through law school on a lot of the jobs. There were, it, was, it was a division of, uh, of alcohol and beverage, uh, alcohol and, and, uh, and tobacco. So my job basically, in those days, the, the state had a stamp that they would put on the well, cigarettes. the cigarettes, right. It was a stamp. You actually, I remember as a kid, uh, you're putting <coughs> the stamp on these. Right, you remember it from the luncheonette. Yeah, exactly. So I used to do it. So you would have to go out and see that these uh, cigarettes and cigars uh, had the this, this stamp on it. A lot of times they would come in from other states. Yeah, they'd and, come over from New Jersey. Well, New they... Jersey used to be these big tobacco shops right outside the tunnel, and, uh, and guys who owned, people who owned stores would buy cartons and, uh, of cigarettes and bring them into the city. So one of my jobs is to sit in front of the store and take down New York license plate numbers that were going into the city. In other words, to go out to gas stations, um, and, uh, and other places that had the machines and see that they had the stamps. It wasn't a tough job. So that you did for a couple of years. I made $4,500 a year. You know. So you graduated law school, and what do you decide then? 
this was a big decision. I did pretty well in law school, and so I had an right. opportunity. You graduated uh, like seventh in your class, and the third year you were first in your class. Yeah. And I had some decisions to make. I, I interviewed for several positions. Um, one was the district attorney's office in Manhattan. And they told me I couldn't be in politics. That if you're going to be an assistant district attorney, you can't be in politics. They said, my life, I've been, I wanted to be in politics. Yeah. I then had a couple of law firms, Parker Chapin, a couple other firms they interviewed. And they, they wanted a, a, a first-year associate that only was going to work 200 hours a, a, you know, a week or whatever it was going to be. And I knew that I belonged in government so at some point. I knew I belonged in politics. Let's put it that way. And it just wasn't right for me. So it pretty much then it, it, it made my career what it, what it would have to so be. So how did you get to John Lindsay? All right. So I'm in, I'm in t- uh, at City College, downtown City College at that time, Brook School. Um, and a professor of mine, Lorraine Covo, who died relatively recently, uh, brought him down to speak. Uh, it was 1958. I'm a kid. Uh, this tall, patrician, blonde, blue-eyed guy comes walking in. You don't think he was in Jamaica High School, okay? He wasn't in Jamaica High School at any point. Um, you know, this was Buckley and Yale, not 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 the City College in PS34. So um, he he comes in and and he's talking to the class. He's running in the primary against the Republican organization for the Congress, 1958, and I just said. This is my ticket out of Queens. This is the guy I want to be with. This is everything he said is what I thought could never say like he said it. And you just knew he was going to be a star. Um, and so I hooked on to him and um, became his uh, street guy, so to speak. Whenever he went out, I was there. The bullhorn, we, we, uh, these guys I talked about before uh, with, from my fraternity came in and we distributed leaflets and knocked on doors. It, when John yeah, becomes you know, mayor... He, he appoints you, right? Well, 1960, there's a lot of things in between. I worked for Ken Keeney, United States Senator. I worked for Dick Aldridge, your city council person. Uh, and then I get the call, uh, and, but always working with the, uh, as, a, as a volunteer for John Lindsay in that office, doing all the work. We did all the work that needed to be done and nobody else wanted to do. Um, and I get a call in, in uh, early 1965 from Bob Price, who was later to become de- first deputy mayor for a year, and, and, but was the political alter ego for John Lindsay, really tremendous political skills. Uh, he called me out, he says, come on in. So I came down to the office, and he says, John's going to announce for uh, a mayor. Um, he's going to go to five boroughs with his family, make it happen. And that was it. We made it happen, put together the rallies. Uh, for that campaign, I did the, all the advance rallying, scheduling, there was a huge Democratic primary in 1965. Um, and all the focus, is, focus was on that Demo- huge Democratic primary. Wagner had withdrawn from the race, uh, became a wide open race. And for us to get the momentum of publicity, we needed to do a lot of spectacular things. And we're very fortunate because you have people like Lionel Hampton, Liza Minnelli, right, Sammy you had Davis. For these events. Yeah, you know, we, we would. So these are major events. You're dealing with stars here at a truck with all, you know, that they would play on in the sound equipment. And we would do that, go through the neighborhoods, closed streets, go Manhattan Beach, Orchard Beach. It was, you know, it was a, a heck of a summer where we were out there from anywhere from eight to ten stops a day. So what were some of the roles you had in the Lindsay administration? Something was, uh, with the hospitals, one was... Well, it was... I, I Look, I graduated law school. I never practiced law. But I knew I, I should be doing something other than being an advanced staff guy. You know, I, I thought there was more to me than, than that, or at least I, I should learn more. So in a very difficult conversation I had with uh, the mayor-elect, uh, John Lindsay at the time, I told him I, 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 I wanted to, he wanted me to come in, into City Hall, and I said, it's, I think I have to go to a department. Chuck Merlin became the commissioner of buildings, was a friend of mine. He asked me to be his assistant commissioner. Uh, be in charge of administrative and legal hearings and so on, and I thought that would be an opportunity. So I first went over to I, what I thought I was first going over to the buildings department, 
And of course, the especially first, especially since you lived in a building once. Well, that was my quote. That's when that's, that's my when, famous that was my, quote. my first famous quote was, uh, you know, what do you know about buildings? I said, I lived in one all my life. What's yeah. it to know? So, I, we, if you remember, January first, nineteen sixty-six, John Lindsay sworn in, and he immediately has the transit strike, and I'm in the middle of that. Now, there's no way that I'm that I'm leaving that situation where um, where he needed w some of my skills. Um, so I, I, I'm at the, the, then it was the Americana. We're walking to City Hall every day. There's, uh, you know, seven days. We got Sugar Ray Robinson walking with us. I mean, it's, it's crazy. People are cheering on Mayor on Stay Strong by the fourth day. They're now saying, will you solve this thing? They're yelling at us. But so that was, you know, so it's, again, it's at City Hall. I then finally... That strike ended. I went over to find my job, my office, the buildings department. I get a call from City Hall that there's an issue with the uh, hospitals department. They're running out of penicillin and other things, and there doesn't seem to be any inventory system. At that time, there were 17 hospitals, all independent in the, within the city system. Uh, later on, it would be the health and hospitals, which we have today, corporation that uh, John Lazian put together. But there was literally, I mean, people would go up, and there'd be no more penicillin, and they were out of penicillin. It was, no, it was crazy. Direct keeps it. So they asked me to go over. I was asked to go over there and see what I could do about that. What I know about hospitals and penicillin, I could put in a thimble. But it's, again, it's to, to, to be in, to find out what is the problem so, I do. So, how did you become so well liked by the Nixon administration? So, look, you know, you're fast forwarding to 1972 election. Uh, John Lindsay is. Um, uh, you know, is a, at this time, a Democrat. Uh, Nixon sees, he has, Nixon, he had the Nixon enemies list, and he sees certain threats to his presidential run in 1972. The paranoia of the uh, president was quite well known. Um, John Lindsay was a potential foe. Uh, I was the political operative. Um, as a result, and I just, now I'm in, I'm in the, the restaurant business. Right. When this comes out, because now it's after the presidential, you know, uh, and it comes out that there's this extenuous list. And what? And I'm, I'm in the restaurant, and all of a sudden, my, I have the TV on, and all the lights on my phone light up, and John Dean is reading the top 20 names on, on the Watergate enemies, uh, Nixon enemies list. And they say about me that I was, a, you know, a, a first-class son of a bitch. At least they said first class. I mean, that was the first time I said first class. Uh, Lindsay's political operative in charge of youth, destroy Davidoff, destroy Lindsay. And that pretty much is what it said. And that's, so they saw the way to get to Lindsay was to go through me. And they made my life somewhat hell. How did you and Dick decide to go into the restaurant business at the old Tut Shore? We left to run the presidential, took a leave of absence, came back. Did, I did not want to come back uh, after the presidential run. It was going to be a hot summer, and the mayor asked me to return and to make my decision after that of what I wanted to do. So it's the summer of 72. Um, uh, we got the presidential uh, is over. The, I'm back at City Hall. We're going through this, the, the problems we have, though, by this time. The city had quieted down quite a bit. And Dick and I are discussing what we want to do uh, once we leave. Um, and I said, I always want to be in the restaurant business. He says, he says, that sounds like fun. We knew the Reese brothers who had <clears throat> a bunch of restaurants, one being Tut Shores. And um, I went to see them, and they said, how'd you like to take over Tut Shores and make it yours? I didn't know that it was losing money like mad, and what do I know about the restaurant business? So that's, it was really a whim. And what kid who grows up in a luncheonette, doesn't want to own one yeah, of the but biggest a, restaurants this was, in New York. This was a restaurant. It was a jazz club. It was. We made it that. You know, it was, it was um, a huge place on 52nd Street next to 21. It was three floors. We've got a picture of you. we got you and Dick over there. Yeah. Three floors. And, and, and we were, we were going to turn it around. You know, we had this 200-seat dining room with this huge round bar. We had a, a party room downstairs that we ended up making a nightclub. We had every... We had comics there. We had jazz. Several albums were made out of there. Maynard Ferguson, uh, 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 Buddy Rich, Stan Getz. We had comics. We put uh, had uh, Imus for a number of weekends. Uh, he would come over and do a show. Uh, it was and every comic we, at the time. What about WGN? The we also did 
you know, it became the political happening place. A lot of stars, too. We had a ticket tape uh, from Associated Press. It was, every, every, if you came into town, you were there. So, and so um, we had a radio show. Uh, twice a week, we we do on uh, on uh, uh, WGN. What's the WGN? Name? We have a picture of you with Bill Mazer, uh, and at the time, who was doing sports. And then we would Dick and I would do the radio show, and Mario Cuomo, who would be in there regularly, would come on. At that time, you know, he wasn't governor yet; he became lieutenant governor during the period. Um, we'd have anybody who was in there. We'd just bring him on that night, and we had free flow of uh, conversation. So after after the restaurant, what happens? My friends, our mutual friend Sai and a couple of other guys says it's time for you to uh, practice law. And yeah, little, while, while I was in the restaurant business, uh, Sai came in. It was an old friend from our city college days, and uh, and introduces me to a guy named Dick Stein, like Dick Stein, uh, and uh, they said he says you're here giving advice to people, um, and you're making $13 for the steak or whatever it was. To, you know, you could do this for a living and make a lot of money. I said, but that's not what, really what I ever wanted to do. Uh, but the, the restaurant was winding down. I needed to move on with my life. It was time I settled down a little bit more than I was. Uh, and uh, it became intriguing. So I went over there, and they offered me a pretty good deal. And, to, and, and today, the, the firm of uh, Davidoff, Hutcher, uh, and Citroen. Citroen, what do you have, about 100 people? Yeah, we have about oh, about 50 lawyers, and the same in the back room, and secretaries and so on, another 50. So it's gone a long way from myself and Bob Melito sitting at the same table in Dick Stein's library answering the same phone. You know. Let's also talk a, a little bit about uh, you and Linda. Yeah. I don't know what I'm allowed to say. You've been with Linda <laughs> a couple of years. You even got yeah, married. Okay. Yes, yes, we got and married this Bill year. And Bill officiated over that, right? Yeah, um, Bill de Blasio's first um, uh, official uh, official wedding, first wedding performed. Uh, I remember having that conversation with him. And uh, Linda, after uh, being with him for 20 years, finally agreed to marry me. I guess we were both waiting for uh, Bill to become mayor. Right? And you have Kenny and uh, you have... Uh, Linda's daughter, who's like my daughter, um, uh, Jessica, is married, uh, married to uh, uh, Kenny Rosenblatt. Who and the, between them, we have three grandchildren, all boys, two, six, and seven and a half, and they live twelve floors above us in the same apartment complex. And it's a great family. And quickly, uh, you, you had a little prize fight with Jerry Clooney a number of years ago. We were very involved in the uh, United States Olympic Committee, and they. Called me up one day and said, "We're gonna we're putting on this prize of uh, this exhibition at Madison Square Garden with you and some of the people from the with some of the people from the stock exchange. We'd like you to fight one of the professional fighters." I said, <laughs> "Let me this again." <clears throat> they went through it. They said, "We want to raise the money." They raised three million dollars that night. I I trained four months with uh, Jimmy Archer, former light heavyweight contender, down at the Downtown Athletic Club. It was a hell of a lot of fun, and I really thought I could... One more round, I might have taken Cooney. You may have taken it. But, <laughs> but as, as our mutual friends say, Sid's always been loyal to his friends. He keeps in touch with them. You still play tennis with them. You go out, you play cards with them. And, you know, you're, you're the go-to man in New York City. It's been interesting that the, the kid who... Really, you're a Brooklyn boy, okay? We, you know, yeah. you know, too much Queens and everything else. It's, it's been interesting, like, and thanks for being here today. I enjoyed it. My pleasure.